Welcome or welcome back to my channel. Today's video is about how human design, quantum human design intersect with feminine sovereignty. In particular, the eight pillars of feminine sovereignty and the six feminine sovereign archetypes. I've been working with the concept of sovereignty in the personal development realm since 1998 when it was first introduced to me. So I've been working with it for over 20 years, both on my own personal development and in my work with clients in the variety of different businesses that I've done since then. For a long time, my interest was largely on the inner landscape which is what the first four pillars of feminine sovereignty are about, is largely about the inner landscape. And then more recently in the last few years, I've really come to see that for me, sovereignty is more than being autonomous or having self-determination or being able to just speak up for yourself or things like that. More recently, I've come to start talking about feminine sovereignty because I don't think of sovereignty as only being about autonomy or self-determination or the individual rights and that sort of thing. That for me really comes out of the American story and the, the kind of sovereign citizen that was developed out of the creation of the, the US American story. And that has a role, but it's also connected to a kind of story of progress that is unfortunately part of what is leading to the destruction of our planet. We can no longer afford to really be unconscious. We can no longer afford to be moving along in the story of progress as if we could continually build and build and build and take from the earth and take from each other as if there was an infinite a supply because there is not. And so the American sovereign citizen is kind of wrapped up in that story. So for me, in our evolutionary process, I've really come to see that we need to evolve out of that kind of adolescent behavior of just taking whatever it is that you want without having an awareness of the consequences or having real responsibility, we need to mature to another level. And so for me, feminine sovereignty is about us being able to mature so that we can become not only sovereigns of our own individual lives, but also to come together to co-create, to communicate, to collaborate as sovereign beings and then to develop a benevolent approach to all of life that will enable us to heal um, our planet. I'm not actually someone who talks about femininity and masculinity a lot that way, even though I was a women and gender studies professor in my first career, but it is the best term that I've been able to come up with that really has this kind of ethic of caring and of awareness of the animus of the natural world, that everything is alive and that we are connected to all of nature and that we need to find a way to get along with each other, that we need to be able to rise above our traditional way of fighting with each other and really step into our potential as a kind of new human being. This is not meant to be comprehensive or the last word on our evolution by any means, but it is my contribution coming from my six decades of life at this point that I hope will provide you with a kind of structure that you can use to take a look at where are you in your personal development. We all have a place that we're a little more comfortable in, whether that's working in the inner landscape or if it's working in the outer world. So as I go through these, I invite you to consider where you're more comfortable, where you maybe feel you've put more of your attention and your energy so far in your life, and where are the places that you could use some more development. I know for me, when I look at these pillars, there's definitely places where I can continue to develop myself. And there's also places where I know that I need to provide ongoing attention because as I expand into my work in the world, different things that I have worked with earlier in my life come up in a new form. So that is part of the spiraling process, right? We work on the inner landscape. We discover that there are things in our inner landscape that are now calling for our attention again. So we spiral back inward to be giving attention there. And then we spiral back outward into the outer world. So let me take you through these eight pillars of feminine sovereignty. Pillar number one is co-creating 
with the flow of life. So this is about our spiritual connection. This is about our understanding of ourselves as spiritual beings and energetic beings, as well as physical beings in a material world. Now, the feminine sovereign archetype that is associated with this pillar is the high priestess, which makes sense, right? Because she's kind of like our spiritual guide as part of the feminine sovereign archetypes. I associate this pillar in human design with our strategy. Every type in human design has a particular strategy and all of our strategies and indeed our authorities as well are designed to help us to engage with the flow of life in a way that is really beneficial to us. I can say for me, when I discovered human design and the, my strategy and my authority as a generator, it radically transformed my way of being in the world. And it's increased my faith and my trust in the flow of life and in my connection with that. So my human design strategy and authority has been super helpful for me. So the first aspect has to do with how we co-create. You've probably heard the phrase that you create your own reality. Well, you do because what we focus on is where energy goes and that's what tends to manifest in our lives. But we don't do it alone. We do it with the flow of life or we do it with source energy or spirit. However you want to name that, whether that's God, goddess, all that is. My point simply is, is that we are constantly co-creating with that flow of life, with that creative intelligence. It's not something that we do as individuals solely on our own. We do it as we're co-creating. And when we do this deliberately and consciously and purposefully, everything in our life becomes much easier. Now, the second aspect is, is that we are fundamentally creative beings. We cannot not be creative. We are part of that creative intelligence that has, has manifested this universe as we know it. And so we are an expression of that creative intelligence. So we are always creative. I know in the culture I grew up in, the idea of creativity was something that artists did. It wasn't something that we all did. And yet we are creative in so many aspects of our life, whether that is making our dinner or being in our garden or the way that we decorate our homes. Yes, sometimes it does have to do with paintings like my painting here, but sometimes it has to do with simply how we are arranging flowers and putting them on the table for dinner. Creativity is something that is just a core part of us. And as I was saying, co-creating with the flow of life, when we are able to set our intention and we're able to really tap into that deeper flow, our ability to manifest what we want in our life goes up exponentially. Pillar number two is about emotional wisdom. We are emotional beings, fundamentally emotional beings. It's part of our birthright as human beings. And yet for most of us, we grew up in families that were maybe not that emotionally wise and certainly a culture that is emotionally dysfunctional. By and large, we've been taught to suppress our emotions, that emotions were a problem, that we need to, um, we need to manage them in a way that does not honor them. Uh, and that if you're emotional, that there's a problem, right? And so emotional wisdom in these pillars has to do with our ability to feel our emotions. I've talked to people who have suppressed their emotions so much through the course of their lives that they don't feel very much of anything. And so we want to be able to feel our emotions and we want to honor them and we want to allow them to move through us because emotions are energy in motion. And so they are designed to move. Now we want to balance that along with knowing how to manage our emotions in a really healthy way. So I don't mean managing by suppressing, I mean managing by being able to understand when we have something that arises from our inner landscape, a trigger, if you will, or an activation, which usually is connected to some time in our past where we have a wound or a trauma that has not yet healed. And so something happens in present time that then triggers that wound. And we need to be able to, on the one hand, be like, hmm, I'm feeling triggered right now. 
And we need to be able to contain it so that we don't just spew out our emotional energy on other people because generally it's not something that is so much about present time anyway. It's about something in the past. So in that sense, we need to be able to contain our triggers and give attention to them if and when they really need attention, which sometimes they do. But we want to be able to contain them so that we will give them attention at the right time and the right place and not have our grief or our sadness or our anger or our shame or whatever it is just completely undermine us when we're having a conversation with somebody or in a particular situation. So emotional wisdom is about being able to honor our emotions, to be able to feel without being taken over by our emotions in a way that's not healthy. Now, the feminine sovereign archetype associated with this is the wise woman, because the wise woman has really had life experience that has taught her about how to be able to manage both of these aspects, both the honoring and also the containment There's another aspect that is really important that comes out of human design, which is in the human design chart, we actually have a center called the emotional solar plexus, which does not exist in the chakra system in the same way at all. And this is what we call a motor in the chart, which just means it's an engine of power. And what I love about this is it shows that emotional energy is very, very powerful. And we know that whether that is an energy of ecstasy and bliss and enthusiasm and excitement, or whether it's one of anger and grief, right? These are powerful energies. And so what we want to be able to do is learn how to be present to the power of our emotional energies without having to wait for a person or a situation to activate them for us. So for me, I know that I love to generate my own enthusiasm. Enthusiasm is what makes the God within you dance. I love that definition. So I love to work with my enthusiasm. I also love to work with my gratitude. These are powerful energies that enable me to be in a high state, high frequency that also fosters my ability to co-create with the flow of life. Pillar number three is embodiment and physical vitality on our connection with the natural world. This pillar recognizes that we are material beings in part. We're spiritual beings and we're material beings. We are made of this earth. Literally, this physical form, this miraculous physical form that we have is made from the star, which is at the center of our solar system, and from this great planet that comes from the star. And so part of this pillar is our health and our vitality. How well are we taking care of this physical form? Are we eating good food? Are we drinking clean water? Are we making sure to move enough and to be outside enough and to have our feet you know, unprotected right down on um, Mother Earth? In addition to that, we want to be in our body. You probably have heard that phrase before, where it, as opposed to being in your head all the time, you want to get in your body. And for some people, this is relatively easy. For some people, it's really hard. I've worked with people who are both on both ends of the ex- spectrum. I have spent a lot of time in my life learning to be in my body. When I was a young person, I was not very embodied. It was something I had to learn how to do, and anyone can learn how to do it. But it is about being able to bring your consciousness out of the thinking mind and bringing it down inside of your physical form where there is great intelligence and tapping into that body wisdom, that physical intelligence, if you will, so that you can have a felt sense, be able to feel yourself from the inside, to have proprioception, to know where your body is in space. A lot of times when people are older, if they've been sick, they lose some of their proprioception, which is why they tend to fall more. So these are aspects of our physical being that we want to be able to cultivate for ourselves because it it facilitates our wholeness. 
the feminine sovereign archetype associated with this pillar is the earth mother. She is got her feet on the ground. She's very grounded. She's connected to the natural world. She understands how the physical body is connected to the plants. She knows about herbs. She knows about where to find the best clean water. And so she is our ally in developing this part of ourselves. In human design, the sensing circuit, which begins in the right brain and then crosses over, runs over the through the left side, side of the body, comes up through the central channel, it is a right-brained energy. So it's not the thinking mind, right, which is more in the left brain. It is the right brain, which is more abstract. It's more spatial. It has fewer boundaries in the sense that we are connected more to the natural world, more to the cosmos. And we also have sensuality. We are embodied. We learn through experience through the physical body in the sensing circuit. There's also the particular gate, which is the 46, which is the love of the body, which is in the sensing circuit. So it's named itself the love of the body or embodiment. There's also the 515, which is a channel of rhythm. So we can tap into the energy of that channel in order to help us to be able to be more attuned to what's happening in the natural world, which sometimes can be challenging in our really technological world today. Pillar number four is radiance and energetic mastery. In many ways, pillar four is building on both really all the previous pillars, but in particular, uh, pillar number three about physical vitality, because we need to have some vitality in the physical body in order to build our radiance, in order to have energetic mastery. So there's a lot of different ways that you can uh, build this radiance. I like to do this through Kundalini Yoga, which is physical and also energetic, but you can do this in a lot of different ways. What we want to be able to do is to clear out the old junk in our energy, which can in include old stuck emotions that just need to be released, but it can be just energy that's just stuck in different parts of the physical body, which is why I like to do physical activity and breathing because it helps to dislodge those stuck places and helps to release it out of the physical system. Oftentimes this comes with emotions as well, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to process those emotions. It might just be that you have something that comes up and goes out of your system while you're breathing or while you're doing some kind of physical activity. So we want to be able to clear our energy. We also want to be able to build our energy so that we can have more energy or prana or chi. And there are a variety of different systems that help you to do that. I mean, Qigong does that. Different types of martial arts do that. As I said, I do Kundalini yoga that helps me to do that. So you can find an energy practice that works for you for building your chi. It really helps with being able to have that kind of energetic mass and that kind of vitality that we're all looking for. Now, one of the big benefits for this of having radiance is, is that it helps you to become more magnetic. Now, in the human design system, for most types, we really benefit from being able to be more magnetic. So for generators and manifesting generators, we're designed to respond to what shows up in our outer reality. So we want to be able to be magnetic to what it is that we're wanting so that it shows up when we have something to respond to. Projectors are wanting to have invitations. And so when you're more magnetic, you will receive invitations. But it's even good for manifestors and for reflectors. For manifestors to be more magnetic means that they can have more influence, which is what they're all about. And for reflectors, it can help them to be better at reflecting the health of the communities that they're a part of. So all of us, regardless of our human design type, really benefit from building this energy so that we can become more magnetic. The other piece is that we want to be in more in command of our energy. I was talked a moment ago about what can happen when we have a trigger 
or an emotional trigger that comes up. Well, that's very energetic. It's not just emotional. It can, the energy literally can take you over. And the more adept you become with your energy mastery, the more that command you're going to be able to have when situations that come up that are difficult and challenging for you. And we really need to have all of these pieces in place so that we can move into that maturity that I was talking about, move out of our adolescence so that we can be more adults and more sovereign in our lives with other people. Pillar number five, which is to know your purpose and your contribution, is the fulcrum point. The first four pillars was we were spiraling around inside of ourselves and really working on developing our inner landscape. With this fifth pillar, we're still in the inside with knowing one's purpose, but then when we start to look at what is our contribution to the greater whole, this is where we start to turn outward into the outer world. It is so important for us to understand our purpose and our contribution, particularly in the world today. It's so easy to be overwhelmed and confused by so many different opportunities that we have, and frankly, by so many different things in the world that need attention. It's important for us to really understand that we can only do our own part and to have relief in that, that it is not our responsibility to try to single-handedly take on the big issues in the world. Like, of course, we can't do that. We can do that when we collaborate with other people on particular projects and particular areas. And that's what we need to know for our own contribution. For some people, they know their purpose early on in life. Like my dad knew his purpose from when he was a young man, and it was the same thing throughout his entire life. For me, I've explored and done all kinds of different things in my life. And I always had this sense that I was meant to do something, but I didn't know what it was. But now that I look back over the course of my life, I actually was on purpose all of that time. But the forms through which that purpose expressed itself changed to some degree. But the through line has always been about manifesting higher consciousness, both individually for me with my students when I was a professor and then with my clients and my students and programs ever since then. So you may feel that you know your purpose or it might feel a little more opaque to you, but it may be that you've actually been more on purpose in the different things that you've done, but you haven't seen the through line yet. Where you choose to make your contribution or how you choose to make your contribution can change through the course of your lifetime. I don't think there are many people like my dad. Actually, I think he was an exception. Um, certainly in today's world where there are so many different directions that we can go in. And so what I want to say to you is to be gentle with yourself and kind with yourself if you're not super clear on these things and know that you probably have been making your contribution, but that at this point you might want to up a level and become more focused on that. Now, human design does have some ways to really help us with that by looking at the human design chart. Now, this has to do with in people's individual charts, so I can't go into that in a lot of detail with you here without out looking at your chart. It is something that I can do in a reading. But I just want to give you an example from my own um, chart. I have a lot of what we call individual circuitry, which when I learned that, it explained me so much. <laughs> And it actually gave me a lot of comfort and was very relieving because I have never really fit into things. I mean, I've participated, I've been a part of groups, I've created communities and so on, but I have always been different. And what I've learned from my individual circuitry is, is that I'm here to be different. I'm here to bring change. I'm here to create new forms. I'm here to present new possibilities and new perspectives that I'm really an expression of that evolutionary impulse of humanity. It's a core part of who I am. Almost all of my circuitry is individual. And when I learned that about myself, it helped me understand my purpose and my contribution in an entirely different way. And it helped relieve me of any anxiety I had or self-judgment that I had about not being able to fit in better. Instead, I've really embraced that as part of my character and part of my purpose. Also in the human design chart is something called the incarnation cross, which is something that 
you can go and do a search on the internet about. Um, and it also, if you get a reading, then you'll learn about your incarnation cross. And that's often a place that people look for their life purpose. But my experience as a human design expert is, is that it's often more complicated. Like, for example, in my incarnation cross, only two of the gates are in our individual energy and the others are tribal and logical. So that in itself wouldn't have given me that same kind of understanding about myself. The feminine sovereign archetype associated with knowing your purpose and your contribution is the visionary, which really makes sense, right? Because the visionary is the one who understands why we're here, what it is that we're doing as we're here, and what it is that we can see is the way that we can contribute. The last three pillars of feminine sovereignty are the ones that were really focused in the outer world. And this is where the work that I did before, what, what I call personal sovereignty, is different and it became feminine sovereignty because these three pillars really have to do with how we engage with others in the outer world. Pillar number six is excellent communication. And there are several aspects to this. So it's important for us... It is important for us to be able to speak up for ourselves, to be able to speak our truth, to be able to be articulate and clear about what matters to us. This is particularly true for people who have been marginalized. So for people of color, for white women, for LGBTQ people, for people from countries that are not as resourced as people in the Western world, whatever aspect may have contributed to you being marginalized in your life. It is important for you to be able to speak up for yourself because often people have been shoved to the margins are not really given a voice. And so for you to find your way to be able to express yourself is really important. Now, it is vital that you can express yourself so that you are heard because just expressing yourself and when nobody is listening or in ways that are shoving people away, particularly the people that you want to be able to hear you, that's not so effective. One of the things that human design teaches is, is the right timing, that we need to express ourselves when people are ready to hear what we have to say. We need to be recognized so that the people who are there are ready to hear what we have to say. This is particularly true if you're going to say something that is challenging for people to hear. So right timing is something that's really critical to be taking into account. There are other aspects of human design that can illuminate this. For example, if you have an open throat, I have an open throat and I used to blurt things out. I used to say inappropriate things. I used to say things at the wrong time. That all has to do with the open throat. So there's a variety of different aspects of human design that can help us to understand about communication that's particular to our own designs. The second key aspect is listening. I always like that phrase that, you know, God gave us uh, two ears and one mouth because we're meant to listen more than we speak. I think there's some truth to that. And unfortunately, many um, people have been acculturated to speak up and not really be listening to each other. They're just preparing what they're going to say when somebody else is talking. And so they're not really even listening. So our ability to actually put aside our own thoughts, to put aside our own agenda and really hear what somebody else has to say, take it in, be able to say back to them what you heard from them, to be able to open up your heart so that you can empathize with what it is that they're sharing even if you don't agree with it. And so this is really key. I think a lot of times people think that if you actually listen to what somebody says and you're able to empathize with it to a degree, that that means that you agree with it. It doesn't necessarily mean that. Although when you go through that process of really listening and being able to take it in and, and get where somebody's coming from, your position may change. And that can be a positive thing. Now, the third aspect is the willingness to be influenced by what somebody else has to say. Now, this isn't about you just giving up your point of view in order to be a peacemaker so that there's no more conflict. It's not about that. It's about having two or more people who are willing to speak up and share their truth in a way that is designed so that other people can hear it and everyone else can really listen to that. 
that as that happens, you know, in an interaction or in a circle of people contributing, that there is something really magical that happens, which is that a new shared understanding emerges out of that communication. So that it's not just each person has their own individual point of view and their own individual thing and everybody hears everybody. It's actually that something new emerges out of that. And that's really what we need to be able to get out of our habitual or traditional ways of being in conflict with each other is to be able to speak, to be able to listen and to be willing to be influenced. Wise Woman is again the feminine sovereign archetype who is our ally with this pillar, just as she was with pillar two, emotional wisdom. And you can see how much our ability to well communicate with each other is going to rely on our emotional wisdom because we have to be able to do that piece of containment that I was talking about before, because when we're listening to somebody that you do not agree with, chances are you're going to get triggered or you very well might. And so you need to be able to contain that trigger for yourself and attend to it if and when it's really important. But it may be that as you develop your listening skills that actually that trigger will dissipate on its own because it can just be a knee-jerk reaction, which isn't really aligned with what's most meaningful to you. Pillar number seven is mutually beneficial collaboration. Now we need all of the previous pillars in order to be able to do this well. Collaboration, uh, when you're doing this with someone that is close to you, um, may not be that challenging of a situation, although with any collaboration, sometimes things come up. But it's really when we're collaborating with people that we may not always agree with. We may be coming from different points of view. And this is what we are, we need to do in order to be able to resolve the big issues that we're facing in the world today. This isn't necessarily easy for us because uh, for many of us were taught that collaboration is actually wrong. I know when I was in school, collaboration was not something you got to do. You were cheating if you were collaborating. I think things have changed a lot since then. There's more working in teams in schools now than there used to be. There's more working on projects together. I think that's beneficial. Um, I know sometimes kids have issues with that because they don't have the skills yet to be able to actually collaborate well with each other. But it's a step in the right direction direction for us to be getting this skill set earlier in life. So I hope you can see how we need these communication skills, we need our emotional wisdom, and we actually need our physical vitality and also our emotional mastery because we need stamina to really be able to collaborate, to be able to stay in collaborations with other people. New World Leader, which is the newest archetype of the feminine sovereign archetypes, is the one that is here to help us with collaboration. Now in the human design system, the gate seven is actually collaboration and it connects with democratic leadership or what I call new world leadership. And this is the final expression of the pattern circuit, which is about being able to see the big patterns. This is collective energy and it is where things like infrastructure, our government is here, you know, global consciousness is here. And so this is what the new world leader really brings to collaboration collaboration, the ability to be able to move out of our tribal affiliations, which have their place and are beautiful in their own way. But sometimes our tribal affiliations get in our way of being able to communicate and collaborate with others, particularly if these are kind of traditional animosities between different tribal affiliations. So it's when we move into the collective energy, which is what the new world leader has, this is when we can move into kind of seeing the bigger picture. I was in a conversation with somebody recently who was sharing with me where she had come to this realization herself. She said, I don't have time to be triggered anymore. It's like our world is burning up. <laughs> I need to not just not give in to that trigger anymore. And that's really where we are with our situation today, where we need to be able to move on beyond our triggers, 
sometimes there are things that still need our attention if there's some trauma that hasn't been resolved and it keeps coming up and it keeps coming up and it's strong, then absolutely, this is where we need to spiral back into the inner landscape and take care of that part of us that is calling for our attention. But then we need to spiral back out again into this communication and into this collaboration with others. And finally, pillar number eight is a benevolent attitude towards and approach to all of life. This is something that I think ancient peoples around the world had a lot more of than we've had in the last few thousand years. This understanding that the world is alive, everything is alive, that consciousness permeates everything, and that everything deserves honor and respect. In our last few thousand years, we've really been in the story of empire, a story of progress that I mentioned at the very beginning of this video. And that has been one of taking over other people, taking over the land, extracting from the land what we want, extracting from animals what we want, um, seeing that the world is here for humanity to dominate, for us to consume whatever we want, right? It's been that kind of an energy that is fundamental to empire. And so we are in a place where we need to evolve beyond that to step out of this mindset of consumption and of extractive uh, economy and of ways of using the land, of using the trees, of using the animals as if they were inanimate, as if they didn't have life, as if they weren't, didn't deserve respect or honoring. And to come into another state where we can ex coexist with each other. My personal belief is, is that pillar number eight is something that is innate to us, but that we have been programmed out of by our culture and also by our ancestry at this point for the last few thousand years. But that in our innate humanness and also in the new human form that we are developing right now, that this is something that is that makes totally makes sense to us. But because of our programming and our conditioning that we've had for so long, we need these other pillars to help us to strip away these belief systems that have led us to the state that we've been in now. And in some ways, this is the most vital and the pinnacle of the pillars because this attitude is what is going to lead us to be different in our daily lives, to be able to connect with each other in different ways, for us to be able to honor and respect and be with the natural world in different ways. And in it, in a way, we come back full circle to co-creating with the flow of life. Because the flow of life is in everything. It animates everything. And when we recognize that we are co-creating with that flow, it comes from our benevolence. And we are the dominant species on the planet. I'm not necessarily saying we're the best, but we are the dominant. And as we come into our full maturity, as the sovereign stewards of our planet, it's our opportunity and our responsibility to care for the other species, whether those are animal or in the plant kingdom or in the oceans, everywhere. So the pillars begin on the inside, connected to the cosmos. They spiral through our aspects on the inner landscape. Then they spiral outward into our relationship with each other and all the way out to our benevolent attitude and approach towards all of life, which then connects us to the greater flow of life and the creative intelligence of the universe. The beautiful beyond feminine sovereign archetype that helps us with this final pillar and really with all of them is the divine mother consciousness. This is the impulse that we need to be seeing that the earth is our mother and we are her children and we need to evolve 
out of being children and out of being adolescents into ourselves, having a more motherly or parental relationship with our earth. And this is for men too, in their ability to provide for and to protect our planet and also for them to develop themselves along the eight pillars of feminine sovereignty. Thank you for being with me here on this journey through the eight pillars of feminine sovereignty. And if you haven't already, I encourage you to take my quiz, What's Your Feminine Sovereign Archetype? You'll get a video and you'll get a beautiful ebook and a masterclass that'll teach you more about all of the different feminine sovereign archetypes. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Many blessings, much love. Bye for now.